no matter the field, if you're working with those type of people, you can learn a ton. You know, I'm just a random guy, but at the root of it, I just believe in that person enough to where I hope my opinion or my comment can help them. Really love just the idea of executing the fundamentals first and then branching out into to whatever you're doing. Pepe, what would you say is the best study food? Ooh, the best study food. What it's keeps... tough because I have like a requirement of like, you can be flexible if you're really good with chopsticks. You could eat like hot Cheetos or anything that normally has like messy fingers. But if you don't have that like small skill of using chopsticks, mm. dude, that's tough actually. Um, I like that. I've heard that... Um the chopsticks things before from d he keeps while he's gaming he, he eats food yeah. with the chopsticks to keep the, the hands clean absolute game changer other than that i just like don't use my hands i guess but um just if you use chopsticks anything chips related you're like opportunities are endless for that so just my personal favorite though like if i had to choose one thing it would be um they're garbanzo beans <laughs> but they're like coated in like chili it's like this mexican thing i forgot what they're called uh, in, in spanish but it's like a chili lime flavored garbanzo bean and it okay. comes in like a little packet with tons of them okay so so that's like a like like a snack thing it's not it's not a meal it, it comes in like yeah, yeah it's a snack yeah yeah hmm, interesting because i know you've gone on some like marathon study hours you used to stream your studying as well um yeah a lot but we'll start that in a second. Tell me about how you first got into to gaming and as a kid, what did you, what did you grow up doing? Oh, dude, gaming, at, at the least gaming, just like PlayStation, Nintendo, mm. back in the day, I'm 28. So like I only had up until probably Super Nintendo. That was my starting point. I didn't own one. So I would just go over to my friend's house and play it. Mm. And same for Nintendo. I didn't own one. So I'd go over to my friend's house and play it. I live in an apartment complex. So I had a lot of friends nearby. Someone had a PlayStation, I'd hop over. Someone had an Xbox, I'd dodge. I would not go to their house. And I would probably not be their friend. Uh, no, but but uh, I just started when I was young, man, just playing a lot of old classic games. Never was really into shooters. Just played a lot of like uh, Ratchet and Clank, Mario, more like character building story arc type of, type of games. Yeah, all the classics. Yeah, just not on Xbox. I never played Halo. I've never nah. finished a game of Halo. You? yeah I've, n I've never played anything that uh is xbox i've never touched an xbox same thing yeah. i don't like the controllers so I've... divisive mm. yeah so <laughs> divisive um so how did you how did you get into to shooters then Were you, was you more like an adult at that time uh i i guess i got into it once i got my computer i should start that like just growing up i had my computer since i was six years old just mm. a regular desktop like hp random computer um I played a, a RPG, an MMO, I guess, called Maple Story, and I saw that the same developer made a shooter game called Combat Arms, I think, and that was one of my first shooters. It was like sixth, seventh grade. That's yeah. when I first started playing, and uh, I've gone the ranges of like you know really skipping school, just grinding out a whole <laughs> day of shooters on my PC, yeah. and ever since then I was just mouse and key, and I, I think it's it's been a long while since I've played on a console because I kind of just loved being on a pc after that it's a whole different experience you're sitting right up against the screen instead of like watching the tv from across the room yeah yeah exactly and like i had a lot of bad experiences with multiplayer game of like going to my friend's house and they'd be just like clapping me on a shooter and i'd be like you know what i can't really mm. can't really keep up with you so i'm just gonna stay home and play on my on my pc anyways but I'd get, I'd get better over time. A lot of different shooter games with them. Because like you had the split screen, but you could see where you're at. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> where's the loyalty and trust in that? Yeah. And then on shooters, you, you just independ on that. So it, it translated over. But uh, after that first shooter game, I just played so many different shooters. And I guess after that, that's when I kind of got more into that genre, for sure. Mm. But I, I still like to be diverse. Yeah, and there's always that um, that 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 side of things when you're playing with your friends. It's sort of like you know you, you're having fun, and but at the same time you don't want to get like you don't want to get beaten too hard. You, you want to win as well. Yeah, yeah. I was a pretty bad. I, was, I used to be a very sore loser, but then kind of going into myself, I got over that, and mm. then um, just helped other people get over that, which I guess trans translates into coaching. And why I like, like coaching so much, but. When it came to shooters, uh, I guess I, I, we've played a few uh, every now and then. Like, I'm very into myself and quiet. I don't give good comms. <laughs> but, 
What? You I now? No, nah, I wouldn't. No, no, not at all. <laughs> the, the few games that we've played together, I, I think I've told you this before, it's the, the comms are immaculate and very, very calm. They're some of the most calming comms I've heard ever. Yeah, I, I think I just like having more fun than like absolute sweat bag. A little mm. bit of sweat, but more just having fun with, with just hanging out with the homies, you know? So that competitive side of you, is that what got you into coaching? Is that like another way you could compete against other people? Or was that just an evolution of like being interested in how things work better? That's a yeah, great question. I, I would say that's kind of what got me into coaching. Um, in most activities that I really, really competed in, I liked being the absolute best. Mm. When I knew I wasn't capable of being the best, I would either transition out of the whatever I'm doing, like, or I would just kind of just play it for fun and not really go competitive. I would give up in my brain and be like, you know what? That's not like the grind for me, mm. but I'm still down to play like sports, like basketball, soccer. Uh, I like played, but I never went like high school competitive. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be the best. Mm. But when it came to like, you know, video games, I was like, yeah, I have to be the best for, for myself. I just like being good. And then I transitioned once I got older, I'm like, you know, I just like helping people. I've always been a, a people first type of person where, um, it very much transitioned into a lot of coaching stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that too. I, I, I was the same as well, where I'd kind of want to be really good at something, but when I saw it wasn't happening and there wasn't any more time I could dedicate to try and get better, I would try and try something else and try something new. Um, yeah. but the, the the coaching side of something of that really intrigues me because um i always pictured coaches of sports and and things like that to be older like they've already gone through their whole career but you've you're, you're quite young when you started so you're kind of very fresh going into everything with with your development and and, and learning about things yeah no, i would say even for traditional sports i guess my main is esports obviously like i've coached a few mobile games and some independent like just players and content creators but um for traditional sports I, I guess i'm still considered young i used to coach at a um youth athletic league and i'd still be the youngest coach there or i, I coached at community college for like a month and a half or so uh mm -hmm. and even then i was like the youngest person there i was younger than some of the players <laughs> yeah. so like, you know what maybe <laughs> you know, yeah. I, was, I was like at the same age too so yeah I, I guess it's pretty young but my wisdom within that just comes from really appreciating the fundamentals of whatever you're doing um I'm probably not the first person you'll go to when it comes to like incredibly super high level strategies, like conceptualizations into execution. I'm very much to like, what's the first step a player does and how do that, how do I get them to the next step? And I, I like to do that for a lot of things, not just like sports, but like content creators, I help them out, management, stuff like that. I just like taking the first step and then branching off off of that. Mm. So you, you like to get a good framework of how things work and, and try and, sort of put those those things into practice for people make sure they're doing all the fundamentals right yeah yeah no, like i really love just the idea of executing the fundamentals first and then branching out into to whatever you're doing I, I see a lot of people especially in content creators where like they branch out first but they don't really solidify themselves like as mm. a content creator competitor or whatever they're doing and it's very obvious to see that like they really really want it they want to be the best they want to be the biggest but they're not putting in the right work at the right time. So it, it hurts my heart to see so many different like friends, content creators and all that, like really grinding it out. And I'm over there like liking everything that they're posting mm. if I can, if, like if it pops up, cause I'm like, yo, you, I, I know you could do it. Cause if mm. you're putting in the work, it'll happen. Just a little bit of luck, a little bit of right placement. Is it, is so it hard? People like you are like, uh -huh. mm. sorry. Go on. No, no, I don't want to interrupt your flow. I don't know. Like pe people like uh, just, like friends that continue on in committing to what they're doing, like those are the people that, although I could say like, oh, I could help them, I could do something, I can personally learn from them. And so there's like a mutual like mentorship that I, I see from, from people like that, that you learn from them and hopefully they improve. Is it, is it hard to not feel like you're imposing yourself on someone or like, do you wait for someone to come to you first? Because I know it's, if someone reaches out to you obviously you you're pretty good with giving advice i know you've given me some some really good advice too that i've listened to but is it hard to not step in when you see someone doing something and you think you could be doing this better yeah it's it, it hurts sometimes man <laughs> it really hurts like there are even some like bigger name content creators like or medium name i, I should say like i really want to message them and just to see like maybe my opinion it isn't like the right one 
Mm. Or maybe it's not like the absolute concrete way because obviously millions of creators out there hitting 10K subscribers, 100K subscribers, million subscribers. You know, I'm just a random guy. But at the root of it, I just believe in that person enough to where I hope my opinion or my comment can help them. Mm. But to step over that boundary and give them advice is so tough because like maybe they want to do it on their own. Maybe they don't reply to you and they just like they're they're too full of themselves <laughs> or there's that sweet line where they're like they care so much that they'll just take any comment that comes towards them and they'll use it as best mm. they can. And those humble people like they'll grow for sure. And like my comment is nothing to them, but it's also everything to them. So I look up to those creators in the in the content space that that balance both of those, like, I guess, paths. I think, I think it's always good to have a fresh point of view on, on things, especially if, um, you, you're struggling and you might know you're struggling or you might not realize it yet, but a fresh set of eyes can, can either solidify what you already know or bring something to light that you should know. So I think it's, I think a fresh pair of eyes is always, uh, welcome out away with words all the time that was beautifully said yeah like that like made a neural connection in my head like yeah that's exactly right and i love the people that can appreciate that because um there's like a level of maturity uh, that, that you can get early on in your content creation um that once it hits like you can see a different form of content from them like a more sincere honest approach to it mm. so tell me about your your first step into content creation because i know that uh you've been streaming you streamed games you streamed coaching you streamed yourself studying you do all kinds of different things how did you get started going live for the first time what made you go live clicking live for the first time was because of a video game i used to play called vainglory it's a mobile moba so it's like league of legends but for the phone it has like a very small passionate community the game kind of died off and it's it, the developers shifted it over to another company but at the core of it at the peak, it had an esports scene with a lot of big name orgs in it, like TSM, uh, Fnatic, Cloud9, and uh, one of the bigger ones, Tribe Gaming in the mobile esports. Um, they were uh, kind enough, I guess, to help us get a Twitch partnership. So I took that opportunity to kind of start streaming a bit more seriously, mm -hmm. streaming the game Vainglory under the name of, of Tribe Gaming for a little bit. But... Um, you know, I was young at the a little bit younger at the time, so a few years back, I didn't take the opportunity for what it was worth completely. But um, after that, kind of hitting live, dwindled down. You know, I went from three times a week, four times a week to like once a week, once a month, once every six months to never. Mm. Um, at you know, that happens to most people every now and then. But the very first time was just like a thrill. It was a rush. Even one viewer, two viewers, <laughs> uh, it was just fun to talk to anyone that hopped in. So. Yeah, I went back and I did some some research on your on your Twitter feed. You you were making videos at the time as well. You were doing um, some coaching about the game and some explaining about how different mechanics and things work. You know the research. Yeah, yeah. yeah I really went in depth with the, the fundamentals again, I guess. And those were my first few videos about it. I, I don't know what the view counts were on it, but I was happy that it even got ten. I, <laughs> I have like a small number side of it where like 10, 20, 30. I was like, yo, it's lit. Like impressive to me and i was stoked about it so from what i, I could, on youtube a bit on that from what i could tell you're getting uh almost you're getting a thousand views on, on some of those videos so you, there were people who well, i guess were, well, well, they're old so it accumulated over time you post something on like youtube like youtube twitch anything you post it it's there forever that's the beautiful mm. part like people post content for like six months uh like ahead of time they're like oh i want like you know 500 views but it's gonna be there forever like you leave it up there you'll get to a thousand in like two or three years Mm. algorithm does it seeing maybe something pops off it's gorgeous so I, I just post it for fun and like you said that was a small uh mobile game so the community um looking for help or like tips online or, or just going to consume the content would be watching that for as long as it's on there yeah yeah and the game's still around too so a lot of it's pretty applicable um but yeah very small community so i was like i said i was impressed when i got like 10 20 views i think even now I don't know what the player base is like, but maybe a couple thousand at most in a month for it. I hope it's more. It's a great game, but a very, very small community. So how did you get into Tribe Gaming? Uh, did you apply yourself? Did they reach out to you because they saw some of your stuff? Like, how did that come about? Oh, yeah. Tons of networking, I would say. And thankfully, my skill backed it up a bit. Uh, I guess my coaching might not be the more like, oh, top tier coach in North America, but very much just like 
uh, I'm a people first person again. So like the, the players that I knew from previous joined that team and they're like, Hey, like we could use your help because mm. you know, they probably saw value in me, which I'm super grateful for. And they talked to the management, they talked to the org and they're like, yeah, we, we could bring them on. So it was me and a friend of mine, um, an analyst, uh, named Viziox. He and, uh, or yeah, we both joined the team, uh, with, with the roster. So I guess I should, uh, give context before that. I was on cloud nine unofficially, no contract for no pay realistically, um, which was still a great opportunity for, for the same game, but just like uh, we got third place at the world championship. And uh, I guess in a good way, it carried over that I went to tribe, but you know, tribe was also the team that beat us at the world championship. So it's kind of <laughs> yeah. like, can't beat them, join them. So. Yeah. I, I kind of, I kind of scrolled. I, I'm not going to lie. I scrolled back very far in your timeline and that was around, uh, March, 2018 that you signed for, uh, Viziox. Uh, yeah. you signed with Viziox. Yeah. 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 And, um, you, you went, the research down. Oh my God. You, you went from, oh. you went from cloud nine to tribe and then to, to cloud nine again, like, uh, further down the track in about what was it? 2021. Yeah, 2021, I think. Oh, wow, that was so long ago already. Yeah, mm. yeah, I signed back to Cloud9 officially. I actually signed a contract this time, which is what most people kind of, like, take for granted. Um, like, oh, I got a contract. I should make money now. I was like, yo, I finally got a contract. It's mm. lit. Like, I made I made it for myself. Yeah, I joined for their Wild Rift team this time for um, League of Legends, literally, but on the phone. Yeah. And how did it go? How did it feel going to, like, a professional esports team uh, did you feel like you needed to do anything different? Were you just like, I'm just going to be myself? How, how did that affect you? Yeah, like our communications within our own roster and then the like management above us was pretty like pretty generous, I guess. They were willing to teach us or willing to talk to us and communicate to us like a normal team, not just like, oh, we're signing you because, you know, for mm. whatever reason. So they, they were really nice about it. So going into that, I was myself as best I could be, but I also wanted to be a sponge for information because um, management and uh, guiding a team, leading a team is something I really, really like to do. So I asked a lot for advice, a lot for uh, like League of Legends team scrim VODs to see if I could use for reference, mm. um, on just how they work, you know, how things operate in the big leagues. Um, so I was myself, but I was a bit over ambitious. I would DM people every now and then bugging them, which I don't regret. <laughs> it, it helped me a ton to do that stepping out of my comfort zone was the best de decision i made for that yeah and it's like you've had you would have had a few years experience being in in that scene you wouldn't have been completely green like you you would know what to do and probably know what you wanted to do differently compared to your first time around yeah actually that's a big realization i didn't really connect <laughs> yeah i would say while i'm learning i was like noted that's dope mm. but i'm still doing my own thing and i, I worked with another coach uh, his name was nanovis um nano we called him he was an excellent coach and I just, I'm more of like a management operations, like, um, like yes, coaching stuff, but helping players be cohesive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but just like the logistics, the day to day, like really getting everyone to operate on a hundred percent. So I just helped him do that for the team and help the team do that. So they could all focus on being like very nitty gritty with the small details, which I believe I was still capable at doing, but it's not what I really like doing anyways. Um, when it came to like, you know, dual management or dual coaching. So okay. it was lit overall to apply myself. What's uh, what's the day-to-day -day on, on that sort of role? Like uh, at an esports team, is it really uh, like a full-time every day, eight, nine, 10 hours a day kind of role or is there more downtime? Yeah, I, I'd say that's unique and case by case, depending on the, the game you're playing. Okay. Like the big league games, literally League of Legends, Valorant, those are seven days a week. You're either practicing uh, VOD reviewing or you're, you're with your team basically maybe you'll have like a day or two off maybe two days off but you're kind of expected to play the game on your off time too because obviously it's your passion mm. but for us um we we still push the you know push the team pretty heavily i would say we had four to five days of scrims a week but only for four hours a day and then we'd have VOD review maybe an hour before an hour after so all in all i would say we were 20 to 30 hours a week um, could have done more, could have done less. Our results were inconsistent at best anyway. So it's like, at what point does our work ethic and all that really matter when um, overall we understood that some teams were practicing less, some teams were practicing more. Mm. 
we just did the best we could at 30 hours a week. Yeah, that's interesting. So it, it is it is like a full time it's a full time job basically. Yeah, yeah. It's it's they they were relaxed though. They were generous. The management was like, Yeah, you guys can scrim however much you need to, however much you want. When you have tournaments, just go for it. No pressure from them. So we, you know, rose to the occasion on our own expectations. We're like, Yeah, let's do like twenty, thirty hours, day off every now and then whenever logistics, you know, needed it. But we were aggressive but chill. So how did all this this time committed to a team? Did you, were you pursuing other things outside of them? Were you you know either personally or professionally? Uh, yeah. In terms of like just my schedule relating to that, I was in school full time too, and some players are also in school full time when they're doing it. So there's a lot of not commitment issues, but time commitment. You know, can't make scrims. I can't make the tournament. You know, mm. I have to, we had a player have to fly back, uh, fly to the finals that we had or I guess like the championship event we had, hmm. leave, go to Texas to go take a final. And we, he missed a few <laughs> scrim blocks and then have to fly back. So it's wow. like, you know, life happens in the way of it, depending on what you're doing. And um, I would say for most people, they're in it for the experience, the clout, uh, the grind, the championship. But hmm. for some people, it's like, you know, we will balance it as a hobby and make it our passion as best you can. Really, hmm. you know, have to balance out the opportunity given versus the long term return for yourself like school or something yeah absolutely and that's such a unique experience too not a lot of people would ever get to experience that kind of thing that you did um yeah there's obviously a lot of lessons that you would have taken from from that um but how did you go about managing your time because obviously you're still in study now you're almost finished um did that help at all like learning that you could actually do and undertake so many different tasks at the same time uh yeah it helped a lot because um when you understand your own you know personal i guess win condition you're like you know what's going to make me successful at what i want to do um that's where you start executing your time constraints where i wanted to go to school full-time i need a degree i need to get a career path in, in my passions mm -hmm. for that i was like that's going to be first almost always so i'd work as hard as i can to finish all my assignments because my passions are what I want to make time for anyways. Yep. And my passions, you know, we're coaching. So I would say I need to work incredibly hard at my studies so I can enjoy the time and create time to put into the esports organization because they gave me an opportunity and they gave me a, a small little salary to, to help benefit it. And, you know, I, I want to make the most out of it. This. Hi, my name is Pepe Tapia, which is also my in-game name. And I'm one of the coaches for Cloud9's Wild Rift team. I am super, super stoked to show you all the hard work our players have been putting in for this upcoming battle for the title versus Immortals, Tribe, and other orgs. I am super excited to work with this Cloud9 Wild Rift roster. Tough and exhausting, but most things are when they're worth it. Absolutely. And so you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel now for your studies. Um, and like we talked about earlier, you're looking for jobs now soon you've had some pretty pretty unique experiences in terms of um a future self with uh with amazon reaching out to you and and doing this documentary series on you can you tell me a bit yeah more about that yeah it's crazy because like like you said opportunities are just like nuts to me like i'm blessed that i even got esports and blessed that I, i've been to singapore for world championship and, and like so many cool things in that realm and then in my, you know, career or passions within like artificial intelligence and machine learning, mm. Amazon contacted me after I did a scholarship that they gave me, completed a course, probably like four, six months later or something. Yep. Uh, they emailed me saying, hey, we have a casting call. You know, would you love to be a part of it? You know, we, we really like your story. Um, you know, let us know. And so I was like, yeah, of course, I'll be in a casting call. It's dope. You know, what is it? You know, went to the casting call. They interviewed me just talked about my life story basically kind of what the video says is a full start to finish of me being you know hispanic uh first generation college student and i'm in artificial intelligence and machine learning which is kind of mathematically heavy and you know technology based so it's like rare in a sense to see hispanic first gen within that okay they're like yeah we like it we like your casting call edition everything like can we shoot a docuseries three days of 16 hour ish shoot days wow and i was like yeah this is I can't believe any of this happened. So I'm up till now and I'm still getting like the benefits from taking that experience. Dude, I've, it's uh, the, the first one is 
just on Instagram is on like 14 and a half million views. When my friend pointed it out to me, I just, <laughs> I, I don't know. I was told, and now I know from hindsight, uh, from someone that uh, meant, uh, commented about it on Twitter, hmm. that they ran it as an advertisement, which oh, is okay. obviously going to inflate the views, but still mind boggling that they used me as an advertisement. Mm. I didn't get that much money from it. So maybe I could have negotiated more. I don't know. In heights, you know, you just take the opportunity for what it is. So yeah. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll take, I think they gave me a two grand for, for three days of shooting, you know, my life story, photos, all of that too. And it was, yeah, it's money to me. So the opportunity, obviously. Yeah. There's a lot more, but and there's five million. Yep. And the, the second one's on, on 11 at the moment. Um, there's 11. Yep. I, I don't know, man. I'm, I just go. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's crazy. So, so to think there's like over 50 million, sorry, over 15 million people have seen and heard your story and, yeah. and what you have to say, that's, that's one of the, probably one of the most unique things that anyone could experience. Yeah, it definitely is. It's like, um, the experience itself made me wish I could just like, kind of like what we're doing here, like sit down, just talk to someone, get to know them. Mm. I want to be in your shoes because like really getting to know someone knowing their story and appreciating everything from it helps you take on those lessons and really you know find value in someone else and it's so beautiful such a beautiful process that i'm jealous of you i'm envious so no, no. cool gig you got cool gig you got that that's that's unreal um so how was it f like expressing you you revealed like a real you know i want to say intimate side of you but a real, real side of you to, to, to cameras and, and to, to strangers almost. How did that feel? Was it, did it yeah. feel, did you feel like you had to push yourself out of your comfort zone to do that? Or are you naturally a talkative like that? And I, I would say that the director and the cinematographer did literally all the heavy lifting of like bridging that emotional gap. Mm. Um, uh, the director his name's alex cinematographer walter uh they came over probably like a week beforehand and just looked around my area i'm in walking distance from the school in the little park looked around just to like see some good you know good places to shoot some good angles what the lighting is like just like observing but the whole time risa and i risa my girlfriend we walked with them like guided them everywhere we just talked and got to know each other and like yeah. really like fleshed out whatever story that they were trying to build and the director was incredibly passionate at what he does that it made the world of a difference of me opening up. And we just sat right back here uh, for like six hours being interviewed on, on mic, obviously you know, mm. got cut down to like four minutes or less. But yeah, that process was made so, so easy when you have like a really good director and cinematographer just being passionate and really like, but they wanted to know my story. They didn't want to push something out mm. for a story which is way, way different. And I'm glad it showed up. And, uh, yeah. So they were, the, they weren't, they weren't chasing a narrative. They were, they were literally just, just trying to bring out whatever you had to say. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's the really hard part of storytelling for whatever realm you're in content creation, you know, you know, your career, anything mm. like it's really hard to frame a story in a very natural way. Mm. No, that that um, that would have been such a cool experience too. And working with with people who are, like you said, passionate about what they do, but very professional, and obviously knew what they were doing, um, was that eye opening in any way? Because I feel like every time I get I get to experience or hear someone talk about something that they're very passionate and professional about, it's v like for me, it's very inspiring. It doesn't matter the field. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I love that you said that. It doesn't matter the field because you give me chills saying that. Not many people appreciate that. Like, uh, for example, I did marching band um, through high school. But after high school, there's like a marching band level that is like similar to um, kind of like I mean, some people refer it to as like the G League of basketball or the okay. NFL of football, whatever scale you want. They have the privilege of traveling around over the summer competing touring on tour buses and like you're in a group of 150 people mm. striving for perfection that is where i got the first instance of passionate people working incredibly hard and professionally to create a product at a very high level and so I i'm grateful to have appreciated that because I, I feel like not many people have that chance they play like high school basketball and it's pretty close it's really close 
but there's like a special spark that happens when you have like incredibly high level of execution with mm. everyone on the team giving 100 percent and those three days with the amazon film crew just magical and like chilling on how that worked out and i absorbed their information i asked so many questions because no matter the field if you're working with those type of people you can learn a ton and improve yourself off of that so that's gorgeous that you recognize and you you think that whatever field they're in like it's just so cool so valuable right like oh, beautiful dude actually beautiful <laughs> yeah no it is because it, one of the reasons i wanted to start the podcast was obviously talking to people about what they're passionate about their hobbies but also having the chance to talk to people who do this full time um someone someone um put this to me i've heard it so many different times but like you could hear you could listen to a, a plumber talking about plumbing if he's really really passionate and excited about it, it it draws you in it's almost like watching a joe rogan podcast where people talk about all sorts of topics that you've never heard of but you learn things and you, you take it in because they're they're top of the field they're very exciting or they're like passionate about what they got to say they got some interesting insights so you've obviously had this coaching experience you've had all sorts of life experiences and and now this amazon thing it's like a, a completely unique story i think it's amazing to hear thank you i appreciate that because you know likewise to you obviously i'm going to gas you up but like <laughs> seeing passion in people makes people go to that person any content creator obviously very passionate no matter their branding some people are super toxic but they're passionate some people are just loving and caring mm. and they're passionate you know those people are the, the people i want to be around for sure so we cross paths through um through twitch through sock gang which is exact the streamer back in COVID times yeah, we, peak. Yeah. peak COVID. were you doing a lot of twitch at that time obviously because of lockdown for me it was lockdowns that's the whole reason i was spending so much time in twitch but warzone brought me to to the to the scene and then i found community obviously at a time where it was hard to go physically see people yeah that's that's a good point because i feel like a lot of people came out from that just either just completely growing or just enjoying themselves streaming mm. oddly enough i purposefully stayed away because I have two brothers that are, you know, they don't live with me now. Uh, they live back at home. Mm. During COVID, we all played Warzone together. And mm. I heavily regret not doing some type of, like, content behind that. Because three brothers, they're <laughs> cracked. They're yeah. actually cracked. I think I'm good. I got a 2KD. Mm. But my old, younger, older brother, he's, like, he's 19 or 20. He's 20 now. He had, like, a 2.5 on, on controller. Mm. And my younger, younger brother, who was, like, 11 at the time. He's, like, 13 now. He had a 1.8. So like three brothers, just absolutely actually brothers. Like mm. Bakar bros are one thing, but like us, that would have been content <laughs> yeah. on another level that I just missed out on. Mm. But I wanted to spend time with them, enjoy it. Maybe I could, and maybe I could have put the work in. But COVID, I spent my time hanging out with them, chilling with Saw Gang on Twitch, just casually relaxing. But man, so many missed opportunities that I think COVID brought in a good and bad way. A lot of new friends and all that. But missed out on that Twitch train for sure yeah it, it would have been it would have been like a different dynamic knowing you're on camera i feel like sometimes but obviously when you're playing with friends there's some one-liners or there's just some inside jokes that happen that you need to capture sometimes that are just hilarious yeah. even for the sake like yeah all along that like just for the sake of recording it for the memories mm. i can't tell you how many times i've gone back to a few games that my brother recorded and posted on like youtube off of his playstation like super bad graphics and all that but like just to hear the memories we had mm. we're just looking back at uh, games from exact on youtube back from pre-covid when like you were there for that game like you just mm. think back and just so much fun just recording something for the sake of like memories is also a big part for i'm sure why most people keep streaming on twitch and youtube so i wish i did that. i should do more but kind of focused on my studies for now yeah and i found you obviously you were streaming on and off you know infrequently you were either doing warzone or you was you were studying but it was nice to put a face to the name because we interacted in chat got to know each other and it was nice to to see and hear you and 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 hear what you had to say yeah yeah honestly like um a big reason why i stopped streaming too is uh kind of like i don't want to say ptsd it's very aggressive but like i have a bad interaction with long streams and I study for a long time. Mm. 
when I streamed uh, last, it was like two or three days back to back of like eight to 12 hour streams. Mm. My girlfriend wasn't here. So normally she's here to say like, hey, you should take off your headset and just like breathe, mm. get some air, do something or like, hey, make sure you eat. So after the third day, I, I noticed my ear started hurting. And like two or three days later, I had a full blown ear infection. Oh, wow. And then another day later, somehow it got to this ear and I had double ear infection. And then, um, you know, went to the, the doctor and they're like, Duh, did you have like a, a lot of water in your ears? I'm like, yo, I was sweating from my ears. <laughs> That's true. Like, captured yeah. in. like, oh God, like maybe, maybe touching grass is good every now and then. So I, I took a break, kind of focused on my studies and made sure I set timers to be healthy about that. So yeah, that is that experience got me off it? That's, that's definitely, um, that's definitely tough. Do you, do you feel like it's something that you go back to or you put off completely? I'm definitely going to go back to it. I, I know for sure. I want to go back to it. Um, my girlfriend and I have a, a plan to start YouTube, but we're going to start small with um, how we plan and increment within that. And we're going to take a very business approach while having fun. It's going to be tough, but hmm. after I get a job, after I, I pay off expenses, life, all, all that stuff and catch up, we want to start a Disney based YouTube channel where okay. we just go to Disneyland and kind of like a Disney vlogger because we go so often. I was blessed to get uh, two passes for us. And uh, our branding is literally the most perfect thing that it makes the most sense. We have to do YouTube okay. at some point in time. My last name is Tapia. Hmm. Her last name is something. Um, you can probably guess, but them together creates tapioca. Okay. Uh, so like boba is a very common popular culture thing. Obviously, I, I don't know maybe where else it is, but very popular. Tapioca is the root of boba, of just like conceptually. Mm. So tapioca time, we'd make it about our adventures. And at the end of it, we just want to be sipping on boba, talking about our day. Yeah. So like the branding was so perfect that I was like, do we just have to do it so perfectly? It's all laid out for us. Like, why not just do it? it sounds like an opportunity waiting to happen. Yeah. yeah. So I'll give it time, but I need to get, get on my feet first before I can start walking and then running. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that you mentioned earlier about um, feeling like a mentor to people. Is there anyone out there that you lean on for mentoring or like advice or, you know, people who you look up to that maybe don't even know that you look up to them? Uh, yeah, actually. And God, you have such a range of like the depth of your question. Cause <laughs> yeah, there's people I look up to that don't know. I look up to them. There's mm. people that I, I actively like ask for help and advice that they know I do. And then lastly, the most important one is Risa, my girlfriend. Like, I know people say like, you know, that your loved one is everything, which they should be, but it feels nice knowing that she is my everything. Like she got me out of jail. Mm. Uh, she got me out of like all my rough spots. She was with me through me of everything, yep. uh, convinced and inspired me to go back to school. And like, she's with me through everything that I like, I owe it to her to be successful and, and get back on my feet. And then alongside that, um, may from exacts uh community may he's huge in terms of i i'm learning more and more about him but for his privacy sake like he's related in what i'm doing so i'm pursuing that and like just asking him questions whenever i can about like yep. how to be better in that specific realm that we share and uh his help has been just more than i could ever ask for anyone to have ever done to anyone and i i owe him a lot and i want to return the favor and all that but uh He's also someone I owe it to, to be successful. Mm. And lastly, which is a big reason why I joined the podcast, like you are someone I like really look up to in terms of like a consistent worker that does something because they want to do it and not because someone or something is pressuring them to do it. Oftentimes you see people asking like, Hey, you know, should I post a YouTube video? You guys want to see a clip? Like, what? tell me what content to do next. You more say, this is the content I'm doing. Like, you know, you talk to people, help branch out, but you still do the content, whether or not you have one, 10, 50, 1,000 views or whatever it is. And that's something that most content creators and most people don't have at their core. Putting in the work for the sake of yourself and not for anyone else. And I see that most consistently for you, so... That's a big reason why I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a, like, I <laughs> secretly like what I'm learning from, like how can I be better in that realm? Cause I'm not good at that. I can't do things for myself all the time. And I feel like I can learn, learn a lot from you just watching how you do things. 
Trust me, I read your Discord. So hey. uh, I just like <laughs> like looking and keeping track of like certain little th- uh, aspects of how you do things. No, nah, I, I, sure. I, I appreciate that. And um, that means a lot to hear as well because I do pretty much do whatever it is I feel like I'm enjoying. And, and the podcast is one and your name was on my list of people to talk to from the start. There was like six or seven people. Yours was on there from the start. Um, so I'm glad that I had the chance to talk to you because obviously a lot of what you do inspires me as well. So um, yeah. I appreciate the great words. community, great network. And I'm glad Joe will. I saw that one, that podcast. I was like, yo, how? Like, how? What a <laughs> humble <laughs> Joe will, but amazing opportunity for you that you just worked so seamlessly. And like, there was no pressure of like, oh, it's a big content creator. Like, there's nothing about that that was unnatural. And I just enjoyed watching it. I was like, dude, I get to be on the podcast too. Like, yo, yeah that's dope. that's that's a that's an opportunity as a whole so well i'm that. glad i'm glad that your name will be on my my youtube channel for for as long as you'll let me have it on there um hey, that's what i'm saying yeah, yeah like two months at most. Okay. no yeah fine you can have it as long as you want it's all yours no but uh like i i reflect on the way that we met was through watching exact and through sock gang and finding community that way and there's a lot of relationships that i still have from the, the time in 2020 when we just first connected for the first time that it's it's amazing to me that you can find that through an online game through twitch and and just like yeah. it, it's like networking isn't it yeah yeah a great word to use at this time because networking is incredibly important to have as a skill and you know us doing that through twitch and at every point there's a small aspect of networking but also an aspect of friendship that's behind every relationship that mm. so beneficial to just branch out, talk to people and, and enjoy people's company. And man, I miss, I miss COVID for the time that it gave us, but mm. I'm, and I'm glad it gave us like the people that we know now about it. Yeah. Good community that came out of exact uh, streams. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how does that, uh, that networking that you've, you know, the community that you've learned has given you more opportunities. Is there coaching that you want to go back into yeah, um, just from that alone, like just watching Warzone all the time. Like I got a 2KD, like I'm not the most absolute top tier cracked person, but just from a coaching perspective, I understand the game at a level that I know has benefited people. Like I've taken myself or friends from like a 0.5 1KD to like a 2.0 KD. And mm. like, yes, it's sometimes it's clickbaity title stuff that I can make a YouTube about like oh, one trick that'll get you to a 2KD <laughs> like stuff, but other times it's like players are like wait what what do you mean like you can do that I'm like, yeah. yeah just here's why like here's how like let me get, give you the details about it and i just do it for passion but i had a few smaller content creators that i, I guess they want to remain private for the most part that i've helped just in warzone not even their stream just in warzone how can they be better mm. it's very casual give them pointers but it wasn't like oh i'll hire you until one day someone was like hey do you mind giving me a few lessons i'm like bro you got a 2.5 like you mm. sure like what, what can i do for you and we just talked, hung out. He gave me a chance. I was like, oh, it's, it's easy to coach like someone to get just better at anything. It's just networking at mm. its core. And I, I do want to go into bigger projects like that, um, coaching in general, whether it be the product I'm working on now or individual content creators and streamers in whatever games that they're doing. Because after studying them a bit, I think I could definitely help out in coaching in, in whatever game that I'm passionate in. So my impression of coaching obviously i'm pretty fresh or green to the esports scene but in terms of sports and things like that i've always had a had an eye for it as well where there's a lot of people who will either be the type of coach where they focus on the technical side of things like the skills like the tactics and there's some people who are better suited to being uh, a personable coach like the, the person who gives confidence inspires uplifts and and gives inspiration like the best coaches have a mix of both. How do you see, where do you find yourself on that, that scale, that spectrum? Man, I just, my ego wants to <laughs> say I'm the best coach. I, I think I balance both of them, both of them, okay. but I'm, I prefer to be the personable one mm-hmm. uh, first and then later on get to the nitty gritty details. I, I'm pretty flexible and I've proven that for myself um, in multiple different teams that I've worked in. And uh, one of the more recent ones, I, I was more of like the Cloud9 Wild Rift. I was a more personable like management, just help everyone be the best they can be. And reading the room, knowing what the situation needs, uh, helps me get there. So 
if someone asked me to coach them, I would just read them and see what they needed and fit into that. So I, I think my flexibility in that makes me believe I'm a pretty good coach at, at the games I choose to coach, like uh, Warzone, hmm. uh, Wild Rift, uh, League of Legends, stuff like that. So these games that you've been coaching in, you've obviously had a background in them before you started coaching. Do you feel like you could apply these sorts of skills to a, a game that you haven't really had much experience in? Is it like that crossover? Yeah, yeah, tons of crossover, especially within shooters. So there's a lot of fundamentals in it. I actually just started playing Valorant recently and kind of like coached myself. I was, you know, I did my 20 games, played with a few friends, uh, and they were like pretty good. And for me, I was just like learning it in a coaching way. I didn't like, let me just hop on, like shoot around. I learned as many heroes as I could, read their abilities, saw the the cost, the economy, how everything works on a, like, you know, fundamental level at a game mm. you know, dictionary level. And then I applied it to, to the logic. I learned like little different tips and tricks here and there, but the fundamentals of like, uh, you know, how to push onto a site, how to get off a site, um, reapplying all of that logic that I've learned from previous games onto that got me to like silver in like no time. Mm -hmm. And I know if I really, really had the time, if I wanted to, I could probably get to platinum pretty easily. Maybe not like if even diamond, um, my mechanics are pretty set. I would say I'm consistent in shooters, but mm -hmm. my ability to coach myself, uh, I've repeated over different types of games and I've gotten to pretty good ranks in most games. I know that you did a lot of, um, data accumulation and analysis and, and things like that. Did that, did that help as well? Like for your, your own, not your own, not just your own personal experiences in gaming, but as a coach, because I, that was like your own personal side project. That wasn't really a necessity as part of your job, was it? Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's, God, you're a beautiful human. Yeah, that's a hundred percent like how I um, kind of prove myself to either players or like um, teams in general. Most players and teams kind of have that side to them where like they, they think they don't need a coach, which they might not, but you also have to prove yourself to them. Mm. So using data, I would just like find unique points, unique instances, unique interactions, tell the player and they'll be like, oh, he actually taught me something. He's like not actively playing the game, but he knows the game actively. Mm. And that would impress some of them and be like, oh, I can trust this guy. And, and gaining that trust, I really took home with because, uh, once you get a player's trust, you can definitely like start working with them on a different level and being able to use data and just other techniques within understanding a game at a very document, like bare bones level, mm. um, just really adds a lot of value because most, most players don't even do that. Most players don't even know like unique interactions or small little details that some random players in the world will know, but it helps a lot. Data is like everything to me. So yeah, good connection there. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's a special type of concentration that you need to be able to read into the data because first of all, accumulating it, writing it, you know, noting it all down, putting it input, inputting it everywhere. It takes a lot of time. There's a lot of work that goes into that. Yo, like, t <laughs> tell me about it. Yeah. Cause, um, I have one project I'm working on right now. It's a bigger opportunity than I can put into words and I can share some of it. I guess it's a Valorant team one of the biggest esports orgs in the world, if not like top three in the world, mm. um, just helping me, like giving me data, making, you know, giving me a small project to work on. And if it all works out, maybe it could be something, maybe it can't, but the amount of time I've put into it so far, it's like the past two days, 12 hour days of just nonstop coding. Mm. But this time I take off my headset to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> quite a specialty but I, I i went to school for it it's like my passion so mixing the two together is just absolutely a blessing um and i think it has a lot of value with a lot of stuff i'm doing uh project wise it's going to go back into this and you'll, you'll probably see it soon I, i'm making a, a quite the special one okay. for for warzone league of legends and valorant but it, it'll take a bit of time is this something that gets done a lot in the esports scene maybe at the top level with with teams that are really committed or is this something that it's sort of very new and fresh that not, not a lot of people would know what what to do with it it's in the middle i'd say i would say um the most notable game that has a strong data analytics background is league of legends um they have data analyst teams and like they're paired with different companies that like help them provide data and just give it out to their players and you know, translate certain aspects to it. But in other sports, it's new. Apparently the Valorant one, not many people are doing. There's websites that have something similar, I guess, but 
to what the team currently wants. Apparently no one's doing it. So to me, that's like, oh dope. It's a huge opportunity, both with a big esports org and also like maybe it can work for other esports orgs and I could be contracted out to them too. Like, you know, there's a lot of uh the sky's the limit when it comes to data and applying it to, to different orgs and different um esports games because not everyone's using it. And I, I think it's very underrated. But it also like like you kind of said, like it takes a lot of time. Uh, unless you're a god at coding, which I'm I'm not a god, so could take a long time. I'm could sure. Time. No, know. I'm sure you're a very high level coder. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, actually, to share, I guess for the Warzone one, one thing that I looked at for one of the more recent tournaments is analyzing the players that are are within that to kind of figure out like how they're getting the most kills in a tournament setting. Mm. What is it about their movement, their rotations, all that stuff? But my most fun part of that was I can analyze a player's crosshair tendencies where let's say you have a gun player like um, a Tom, I'll just use Tommy because he's a really good competitive player. Let's say you have him and you see most of his kills. I made a program that can record those kills and take the patterns of his crosshair and kind of put it into words of like, if you play against Tommy, maybe you should reach out and extend yourself further with like a b-hop i guess that was warzone back in the day right yeah. not warzone 2 but that's how you could counter him so to speak like that's how you can play against him mm. and for most recent players in warzone 2 what i found was like maybe you shouldn't peak more often because they they tend to win uh peaking battles mm. or if you're in a straight 1v1 long range that's when you should fight him because they're really bad at fighting long range Mm. figuring out those tendencies i've been able to do kind of successfully kind of not it's a research in progress but those types of statistics i feel like uh individuals will find a lot of benefit from and right now it's for fun but maybe it could be something bigger no that's that's definitely something that i, I feel like is in a lot of sports uh, i'm not sure if it's in esports because esports is kind of a new a newer sort of um field to be in but that would come in very handy with things like customs and when you actually play top level players against each other that that little just a little insight like that could make the world of difference yeah no 100 percent. i wish more or uh, gaming companies like the developers i wish they gave data out but i have to do it all from hand like find unique ways to find it like that mm. data because it's not all public most of the time and you can't really you know get private data like that so kind of tough but to me so far it's been a fun project kind of worth the time because i i've had a few people reach out and be like yo I, i'll probably pay you if you can get me that so i'm like hey dope low-key i was like all right i'm down i'll try it out and if not it's a fun project mm. and so the people that reach out to to you and and the people who are interested in your work you don't have to name names of anyone you've ever worked with ever but are there are there levels to how into it or how professional top level players are because i'm always intrigued about how the, at the at the at the highest level there are people who are more committed seemingly than others and just like the way they approach their professionalism maybe you know i don't know how, how much it carries over to sports but like to esports but like nutrition um hydration all that kind of stuff that that is there anything like that in the esports world that people don't focus on or some people do yeah a thousand percent yes and to me that's what helps me interact with people uh, i guess in a way it's a negative trait i have but i i kind of take advantage of it for myself i define those people at each instance i interact with them mm-hmm. meaning that if someone approaches me or i approach them to help or to receive help and i communicate with them and we just have a conversation I'll judge them based off that conversation to see how serious they are about it, Mm -hmm. but I won't, you know, make a decision. I'll just be like, here's the initial thoughts. For example, uh, I have a friend of mine who's given me an opportunity. It's the esports organization, one of the top three in the world. Um, I can be grateful to call him a friend and I would not have had the opportunity, you know, otherwise, but he treats me like a friend first. So I'm treating him like a friend first, but he's incredibly professional in what he does you know, decisive understanding and what he needs uh, from me. Where on the off hand, the other side of it, I have another friend who's starting content creation or like he's been into it for a little bit and he's not the most like consistent mm. within himself. So he's not consistent with me. He's not the most like, I need to stream three days a week, four days a week. I'm not taking my craft seriously. I'm not 
you know, doing what I need to do. I'm going to, I'm just going to grind out tournaments because I think that's, you know, the, the route to getting success mm. and I mean, I'm stream content because I think that's the route to getting success back to tournaments, back to content where it's like, well, what do you need for me to do for you then? I ask him and he's like, oh, I don't know right now. It's like, all right, that's fine. I'm literally the same when it comes to my stuff too. <laughs> that's completely fine. Um, but I could just see from there, like, I won't spend too much time thinking about it. So it helps me align myself with my projects because you can definitely see who's absolutely in it for all the best right reasons to be successful versus people who are just kind of like cruising for what they have and they're not really appreciating the opportunities that they could be, could yeah. be taking. Especially in gaming, you would think that there's um, a, a smaller window of opportunity compared to a lot of other sports because of how reaction times and like being young is like a real advantage in the esports yeah 100 percent. i don't know what i guess i, I never asked the ages for half the people i'm working with mm. i kind of assume they're like 20s to early 30s or something but i think some of them are like 17 to 19 yeah um yeah you could really see it in them like they're they know some people know that opportunity because they're like oh you know i'm, I'm gonna be cracked i'm like 4.5 kd I, I can do something mm. others are like they could be cracked or like they're young, but they're like, you know, just like, I want to pursue esports full time, but I might go chill with <laughs> friends five days a week and oh, I'll stream the next day. I'll stream the next day. I'll stream the next day. Like, man, if I was their age, mm. I'd probably not be doing it because my discipline is not there, but I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> man, they're young, you know? Yeah. Like it's hard, it's harder when you look back and think, uh, back and on things and you think to yourself, you know, maybe if I, if I got that, eight hours of sleep the next day or could be even better than what I was, but you can get away with so much when you're younger that it's, it's, you sort of don't even realize you wouldn't even know. Actually, that's crazy that you say that. Cause I had this rare, like just one off coaching instance back in my hometown of this mom, dad, and son that they were like dead set on like, my kid's going to be a content creator. Mm. Like, they, like, you know how you enroll your kid in, like, Pop Warner and there's, like, those, you know, or like, a Pop Warner's, like, football, uh, football, American football, where, like, you know, like, the, that level of passion, but for, like, content creation. And I didn't know what was happening, but they hired me as their coach. Right. Like, how do we get do all this content creation, all that stuff? I set, like, a schedule regiment, like, he should be sleeping this time, doing homework, here's how you balance everything. Mm. And they did it, like, by the book. Absolutely. And then out of nowhere the kid himself makes like some pretty good like TikTok or whatever. And like it blew up to like a scalable amount that he was like really happy with, like maybe like less than 500,000 viewers. Mm -hmm. And his parents were like so happy with me. They gave me like a decent chunk of change. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> Where like the parents introduced the kid to content creation mm. and then set a regiment and treat it like a sport. I thought that was like unheard of. Yeah, that's interesting. And then, uh, I I don't know where he's at now, but that's someone who's really taking the opportunity and their parents are taking the opportunity to do it. So having the range of people who want it, but they don't want it and then having people that want it and everyone else wants it for them. Mm. And then people that want it and can only do it on the, on their own. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy to see how people live within those spaces. Yeah. There is a, like an intrinsic motivation that a lot of people go by, but being your parents introducing it to you is, is different for sure. I wonder how long. Yeah that would last exactly like is this kid gonna get burnt out already? yeah I, I haven't kept up with them at all I, I could probably message him soon but like i just i wonder if that intrinsic motivation for him is even there or mm. if he's just it's kind of like the, they, they were the type of family that they just do things by the book almost always and almost mm. everything they do like they get that oil change at like four thousand miles type, <laughs> of, type of family and i was like yeah. oh, that's cool like you, you do you you're probably successful but it's like, man like i wish some people like had that for what they are now because they'd be doing better off. Like I, I see some content creators are like kind of ruining their own communities because they're not following the path that they, they even said they want to be on. Mm. Like, man, like maybe you need a manager and that's why I step in. That's why I started helping out people. Cause like some people do need that. Hey, maybe they need someone else. They have the motivation, but they don't have like the structure behind it. It, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. Do you, do you reach out to people with, with that kind of um, observation or with that kind of thing in mind? Yeah, actually. Um, there's a, a few people that like, and I hate not naming names, but I, I guess I asked a few people if I could name and they just said no. Sure. Um, that's fine. Yeah. You know, there's, there's definitely more people out there. I'm sure most streamers can relate. 
they want to stream, but there's something like, you know, emotional, mentally, physically that like prevents them from doing it. Something doesn't click. Mm. But if you just have that one person like in, in voice call in discord or anything saying like, Hey, can you pop on stream right now? I want to see something real quick. They'll get on easily. They just need someone to tell them what to do. Mm. And from a, you know, person that's trying to take things serious, like a content creator, they could have a manager do it like hundred percent. They'll, they'll get on everything. They'll, you know, be on a deadline and all that stuff. Lacking the discipline, lacking the guidance is a huge barrier of entrance for, for most small streamers and even medium-sized streamers. That's fair. I mean, that's like most of us too. Just just in life, you don't always get the guidance that you need to get better. But So what, what tips would you give young Pepe growing up or like even young 20s Pepe? What would, what would you, what advice would you give yourself? Young 20s Pepe, that's a really good question too you even young me i would say um, do things for yourself and find out if you're doing things for yourself or for others and i, I would say that applies to uh, you know 20s as well um, kind of knowing your value making sure you're doing things for your purposes and not for external factors that um, m- might not really benefit you mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's an interesting one because I would say there were a lot of times where uh, I've been impressed by my younger brother. He dropped out of college um, right after he graduated high school, got into college, dropped out semester. And I asked him why the most mature response. He's like, I just felt like I wasn't doing it for me. Mm. Yo, that's huge. Like drop out then like take a break, whatever it is like you do you. Cause that level of maturity is going to take him further than I could give guidance towards when I was that age. I I dropped out because I, I was like, well, I'm not doing that great or anything. And yeah, having that level of maturity, I think is something a lot of people could use. Uh, Knowing when you're doing something for yourself is really, really tough to admit and define. Yeah, absolutely. That is, um, that is very deep by, by the, the younger brother. Absolutely. I was mind blown. I was trying to, it's my brother, I guess, but I was never met anyone with that perspective on it. Sure. Go for it. (laughs) So, so where to from here? Obviously you finished college soon. Um, finding jobs, uh, you coaching, is, like, is it all of it? What's, what's next? Well, I started my own company in like January, December, making an AI coach for video games, kind of mm-hmm. like the biggest project I'm working on right now. It's League of Legends. That's like my baby right now. That's the one thing I want to take as far as I possibly can. I need a job though. I need a career. So I'm applying to regular jobs, you know, trying to get a fat salary if I can, but mm. My dream right now is like if i can get that up and working to even like 50 users i'm done i, I can drop out of that i'm happy and um, i want to apply that same ai coach to uh, league of legends warzone warzone 2 valorant apex as many games as i can because i know i can do it it's like literally everything i've built myself up to to now mm. esports and ai and ml machine learning stuff so if i can combine those two that's like my next thing my every day like that's what i'm focusing on right other than that, just chill and hang out with the girlfriend. Hopefully get a job so I can hang out with her more because we have had, you know, not such an original, like, you know, pathway of, like, being able to enjoy each other's company. You know, whether it's, like, finances, which is another thing that I don't get for most people. for streamers and all that. Like, how do how do they make things work financially? But for myself, it's, it's never been, like, the smoothest road of, like, making things happen. Uh, you know, make sacrifices here and there, but... Once I get to like a career, this is my job. This is where I could do things. I hope that enables me to stream. Maybe mm. it's another one of those things where like, ah, uh, you know, if this happens, I'll stream like most people do. But we'll see, I guess. We'll see when that happens. Well, it would be nice to see your face again every now and again. It just just popping up on stream just to say hello. Um, because I do, I do love seeing you on stream. I, I appreciate the vibes, but I want to wish you all the luck for the next couple of months i know you finishing is a big deal finishing school is, is a big deal and and finding a job and all that too so um hopefully we can touch base again further down the line and, and we can find out more about the projects that are still in the works yeah no thanks and like i said thanks again for giving me this kind of just opportunity it's it's rare to have a podcast like that you enjoy listening to not only can you like get to go on it hmm. excuse me but like it has such high value that I feel like people don't really uh, take the time to listen out to. So I'm going to share this with everyone that I can, because yeah. <laughs> I, I guess the value I found from your channel was less of like, you know, 
you go for like background music, but more like that's what you want to watch or that's what you want to listen to. And it's very rare to have that on. Most of the time I just have podcasts on for background. Mm. Not this one. Surprisingly, not this one. I hope, oh, I hope it continues. And I'm I, glad that you're still doing this. Things that you do for yourself is beautiful. Thanks, man. I appreciate the compliments and I appreciate you coming on, man, and sharing your story. It means a lot to me. Hopefully we can do like a flip side one day i want to see someone interview you on your own podcast that'd be one. Dope. i hope you can get like a select person on there in like four or five years it'll be someone that you really like and respect one day I promise it'll happen <laughs> all right thanks man that was really fun <laughs>